Welcome to Endless, a Sandman podcast from Chipperish Media. I'm writer, erstwhile DC Comics editor, and big-ass cuckoo bird, Elisa Quitney. And I'm freely given and well-meant story expert, Lonnie Diane Rich. Today on Endless, we're going to be talking about Sandman, Volume 5, A Game of You, Chapter 6. I woke up, and one of us was crying. I woke up, and one of us was crying was written by Neil Gaiman, drawn by Sean McManus, colored by Danny Vazo, lettered by Todd Klein. This issue was edited by Karen Berger, assisted by Elisa Quitney, cover by Dave McKean. Sometimes inaction is itself action. Time to wake up. In Chapter 6, I Woke Up and One of Us Was Crying, a little time has passed since the storm that became known as Mean Lisa tore down Barbie's building and killed Wanda and Maisie Hill, the I Don't Like Dogs lady. Barbie is in a diner bathroom dressed in a chic black dress as she draws a black veil on her face in preparation for meeting Wanda's Aunt Dora. Catcalled by the local louts, Barbie sits down with Dora, a prim, gray-haired smoker who considers it a blessing that Alvin, as she insists on calling Wanda, was taken when she was. God gives you a body, says Dora. It's your duty to do well by it. He makes you a boy, you dress in blue. He makes you a girl, you dress in pink. You mustn't go trying to change things. Barbie tells Dora a judiciously edited version of the events that took Wanda's life. She speaks of the shock of seeing Wanda dead and in a body bag, and of the news crews. She mentions George, whom she thought was killed gruesomely by the building's collapse, and even mentions seeing something like a tongue slithering through the rubble, but admits she was out of her mind at that point. We also learn what Barbie doesn't tell Dora. Back in the dying scary, Barbie faced a choice. Morpheus felt under no compunction to punish the cuckoo or to rescue Barbie or her friends, but he had agreed to grant her a boon. Eliminate the cuckoo, says Thessaly, unfazed by Morpheus's displeasure with her. The witch woman promises to figure out a way to get Barbie and the others home, but Barbie takes the Dorothy option and demands safe passage for Hazel, Foxglove, Thessaly, and herself. The cuckoo thanks Barbie, who is still seething. Yet Barbie can't help but smile when she sees the thwarted little girl take flight into her life, a beautiful big-ass bird finally able to become her truest self. Now Barbie must figure out how to live her most authentic life. She endures a funeral as grim and dry as Wanda's biological family, but remains behind to give her own offerings, a Hyperman comic, bought from a leering creep at an old-school comic book store, and the idea that everyone has a secret world inside of them. And, last but not least, a final gift of makeup, the name Wanda, written in tacky flamingo pink over the dead name Wanda's family had engraved on her headstone. As Barbie heads off to discover herself out west, she receives a last gift from the westernmost lands of all, which is death. She has a vision of Wanda, perfect and happy and not at all artificial, standing beside death. They smile and wave, giving Barbie the goodbye she never got in waking life. And that is all. All right, Elisa, here we are, the final issue of A Game of You. And um, how did you feel about this story? I felt so very sad. I uh, This has been a strange week for me. On Monday, mm-hmm. I attended the writer uh, Rachel Pollock's funeral, uh, along with Neil Gaiman, and she's one of the people he thanks at the end of A Game of You. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, so, so much of this resonates in a, in a particularly poignant way. And the line, that last line, we should take our goodbyes whenever we can, uh, hits me differently. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's kind of a, a strange alignment of timing that we would be doing this issue, you know, during the week that you went to to Rachel Pollock's um Rachel Pollock's funeral. So and uh, and you know, I'm so sorry for your loss for everybody's loss. Uh one of my good friends uh texted me, had seen Neil um post on Twitter about Rachel and was like, "I had no idea that Neil knew Rachel. Rachel was my favorite tarot, you know, um she was she wrote about the tarot and and did lots of things, did some work I believe for DC as 
well and and told tons of stories in her life and um and so it was kind of neat to see that come around that Rachel was was loved um by a lot of people who didn't know they all loved Rachel together so um so that was a really kind of a, a wonderful thing. And I, I want to say, I, I, this is going to be a little out of order, this episode, because yeah. I feel a little out of order. I'll go into mm-hmm. it more deeply. But because I've been asked to talk about Rachel, I've mm-hmm. put some things together that you would have thought I, I just would have remembered. But Rachel, uh, who became the monthly Doom Patrol writer, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, it started in 1993 when this uh, issue was created. Coming, I mean, when when these when this storyline was being published originally, and um, so I was sharing an office with Tom Pyre, who was Rachel's editor, mm-hmm. and in the midst of all of this craziness, you know, I don't think this will be. I'll go into it more in Lucienne's library. I forgot why this is so vivid for me, um, but okay, here's a little birth with death. So when I was hired, Karen Berger was pregnant. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I've ever talked about the fact that she went into premature labor when I was going out to bring her back lunch. And so I finished this series basically working on my own and with Mm -hmm. Neil's help. So I don't think I've even mentioned that, which seems like a rather (laughs) large thing to leave out. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, this is a really special series. I remember when we sat down and talked with Karen Berger and we were talking about what was your favorite Sandman book and Karen was like a game of you and you know and people have mentioned it to me since we started doing this podcast because I, I of course know nothing about anything I'm coming in the complete Sandman neophyte um, and oh, so one of the things that I've been looking forward to so much was talking about a game of you and going through this you know this whole story so for those of you who are unaware uh, Rachel Pollock was a trans woman and a trans activist um, and you know during this time when A Game of You was being written, you know, we as a culture, like I always say how the stories that we tell reflect the culture we're in back at us. Um, And I feel like A Game of You reflected the, the best parts of the culture we could be. Um, in a lot of ways, in a culture that we're still struggling to to get to, a space where we live in a world where it is safe for uh, trans people to exist in the world and live their best lives, where there are some here in the culture who are trying their best to uh, to make that not happen. So to be able to celebrate this story, to celebrate Rachel's life, to celebrate the ways in which this story absolutely knew who Wanda was and celebrated that. Um, I, I, you know, I'm really honored. I feel like to be part of that conversation. Yeah, I, um, I'm thinking. Well, we'll 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 just talk. As I say, I'm a little <laughs> disjointed today. But um, right. we usually at this point start to talk about Dave McKean's cover, and yes, maybe it's appropriate to talk about the fact how. You know, it's a mosaic of faces, and each Mm -hmm. one seems like a kind of mask because of the placement of the hands on the cover. Mm -hmm. And it's clearly, though, Morpheus's eyes finally peering out at us from behind all these other masks and faces. And to me, that kind of aligns with we get Barbie at the end saying something about how every mundane seeming person in the mundane world contains all these amazing worlds within them, which really mirrors something that Morpheus says, I think, in an earlier issue. Yeah, the the idea that there are these secret worlds, right? And when you think about, you know, every night when we dream, right? We visit these worlds that Morpheus has created for us to be able to spend that time in, but that these worlds can be created through the dreams, that that there is this, this sense of physical space representing um, emotional spaces and places that we need to be able to spend time in. Um, and I, I kind of love, I mean, of course, Dave McKean's covers are always just a place where you can sit and be and figure out what they mean to you. And I think that's part of the beauty of McKean's work. Um, but this, this, you know, mosaic of all of these different faces and the masks that we wear and then who we truly are, especially in an issue in which we get to see Wanda as she truly is, yeah. you know, her true self um, in, in the vision with death. Um, I think it's, it's, just a really 
kind of beautiful place to leave this. And one of the things I love about this is that Morpheus as the watcher, right? Morpheus is not an active, you know, part of this story. Morpheus is watching these things happen and then saying things like, no, I don't feel the need to step in and do anything. Like, I don't feel that, you know, the need to be the hand of justice who decides who is wrong, who is right, who is evil, right? Um, All of that, I absolutely love. And, you know, and to me, reading it now, some, you know, uh, 30 years after it originally came out, um, it is a surprising space to take a story because our stories are so often about, um, you know, about right and wrong, good versus evil, and the action that we must take to like, make the scales balanced and deliver justice. And yet this is such a wider vision of what that looks like from someone as distant to the story as Morpheus is, where he is not placing judgment, but also in not placing judgment, giving us a space to move into where we can look at it from his perspective. Yes, it's definitely a place where his detachment, which is his vice at times, is is also yes. a virtue, which brings me to a little discussion of Thessaly here. Oh, my God. Yes. Let's always discuss Thessaly. <laughs> so, okay. First of all, I love the fact that it's the clueless Aunt Dora who says as a little throwaway line, Thessaly, that's a place in Greece, isn't it? <laughs> and so if you didn't know from your own research or from, you know, our our discussions that Thessaly is a place name and you didn't pick up on the fact that Morpheus calls her Thessalian, not Thessaly. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mm-hmm. get you get Dora's clue here, but I also love these wonderful. At moments, Thessaly now reminds me of Stockard Channing in Greece. He comes on oh. like he's so cool. Who does he think he's fooling? <laughs> and it isn't even as if he's good looking. He's too thin for a start. You know, she's suddenly she's confiding in Foxglove and Hazel as if they're you know the the pink ladies. <laughs> gossiping girlfriends in the high school halls, right? Um, yeah, it's it's kind of fun to see that. And then we have this moment where, where uh, you know, our dear Murphy uh, <laughs> says to her, I don't even know if you're going to make it another century if you keep down this path. Like, it does feel like, like Thessaly is a character who has so much age and yet has not really attained a lot of wisdom. Um, in that time. And I find her so interesting in the way that she is very invested in the destruction of the cuckoo, right? And in this, um, and it seems like it's a vengeance. I don't know what the cuckoo did to her. Um, but it seems like this is very much uh, motivated by vengeance. And that is something that that Morpheus is so far beyond at this point. Well, I mean, the cuckoo threatened her. And yeah. and Neil, when when we had our Thessaly discussions, was very clear. You know, Thessaly is just about ninety nine and ninety nine point ninety nine percent self preservation. She is oh, absolutely yeah. about self preservation, and I think it's it's an interesting moment because I think here we get. You know, we get Thessaly on the one hand as this ancient, powerful witch woman and Morpheus as as this, you know, godlike entity. And in another sense, there there is a bit of that, you know, bad boy, bad girl, Grease thing going on. I mean, there's there's some breadcrumbing here. It's a little Zuko and Rizzo going on. A little energy, a little energy from Grease. I like it. I mean, Thessaly, yes, you know, she is... Probably the most villainous. We're going to talk a little bit about the nature of good and evil and where the cuckoo stands on that spectrum in a bit. Um, But Thessaly feels like so clearly, and again, good and evil is so reductive, but so clearly um, unable to see, right? Unable to, to see anything from a wider point of view than her own little narrow perch. And she has lived for such a long time and learned, it appears, so little. Um, And I think that that makes her fascinating to me. And 
you know, I, I know that there are a lot of things to complain about with Thessaly, but just because she's like, uh, she's not a good person doesn't mean that she's not a really interesting character. Can I give a spoiler? Oh, well, we usually save those for Lucian's library, but sure, it's a 30 uh, year old uh, I have, piece of work. So, I have yes. so much to talk about in Lucian's <laughs> library. Um, yeah. But the spoiler is just for anyone who's read the whole series. So, you know, anyone yeah. who's read on that Thessaly and Morpheus have an affair. Aha. Uh-huh. We yeah. never see her and him together. We pick up after they've had a lousy breakup. And it's definitely, she has definitely broken up with him. She is, she is absolutely left him miserable. Um, so I think it's really fun knowing this to... Is that backstory to this moment or does that happen after this moment? After this moment. I'm so fascinated. I cannot wait. Cannot wait to see how that all comes about. <laughs> we don't um, know. I mean, that's yeah. the thing. You don't mm-hmm. find out. You pick up... Their story when Morpheus is in a funk because his new girlfriend has just broken up with him. And that is all you ever really know. Oh, my God. And, you know, I guess I think she's too much of a villain for a lot of people to want to do fanfic about this. But I have (laughs) lain awake at nights thinking about the Morpheus-Cecily relationships and what their arguments sounded like. And how would that even ever happen i find that really really interesting but you know we'll just have to just have to have that discussion when we get to that point in the story i think we'll have to yes but i i also kind of want i i feel like we should have an open call for fan fictions of you know oh, absolutely the relationship thessaly fan and the fiction. breakup thessaly and murphy uh yeah fan fiction what out would, there we definitely want what to see would that. their couple name be morphosy morphosy that's awesome <laughs> Perfect. I love it. Sorry. All right. No, it's okay. Um, All right. So one of the things, though, that I wanted to talk about and and what I love so much about this story is the way that I like so deeply kind of resisted what this story is doing, because we have fought this whole time for the end, you know, to prevent the land from ending, to save this little world, right? You know, Um, and so we're, this is what we're working toward. This is what Barbie is working toward. This is what Martin Tenbones came to New York City and got shot for. Um, all of these things, you know, are so that the land is preserved and we get rid of the cuckoo that is doing all of this damage. And yet, that fails. That's not how this ends. How this ends is that the land is supposed to end. And at some point, it has to end because endings are both necessary and natural and inevitable. Um, and it always brings me back to this quote from, and I I, I ask your forgiveness now, everyone, uh, Age of Ultron, right? Which is not necessarily a really great movie and written by a um, like a person who's who's had some troubles, uh, you know, in, in, in who they are and struggling with that. Um, but it's Joss Whedon and he has a lot of problems. There's all sorts of stuff that, you know, that he has been accused of and done and yada, yada. And none of that, you know, that's that's for him to, to sort through. Um, but he is a brilliant writer and I will never say otherwise. Um, and one of the things that he wrote in Age of Ultron is a thing isn't beautiful because it lasts. Um, and I always found that, um, such a wonderful way of looking at endings, which is something that I think we culturally really struggle with, you know, um, we always want to rescue everything and make it continue or save somebody and, and they don't die and they don't leave us. And most of our stories end happily with, you know, the good end well and the bad ended badly. And that's what fiction is, right? I think that was Oscar Wilde who said that, um, or something like that anyway. Um, and so there's always like we look for this sense of of justice and and things ending the way that they are supposed to end with with you know the good being victorious and saving the thing and rescuing the princess and all of that. And here we have the end of the land and the death of Wanda that we have to process. Um and it reminds me of the like Buddhist concept of death, that a wave is a thing for a while, something that is part of but distinct from the ocean. And then when it's done what it needed to do, it falls back into the ocean, returning back to its original form. 
And that doesn't make it any less beautiful for having existed. That doesn't make it any less important for what it what it was. But then it falls back into this thing that it is it is a bigger part of. And with the land, we see that very much happening, right? Everything is coming back into, you know, we saw in the last issue, back into Morpheus's cloak. It's not disappearing entirely it's just changing form um and so that is very sad but at the same time extremely natural and so i you know i have this feeling going into this that i like the story that i wanted was barbie goes back and she's victorious and she you know um, banishes the cuckoo and the cuckoo is properly punished um and yet here we are in this story at the end. And um, and again, you know, it's it's another freaking Joss Whedon quote, forgive me, is, uh, you know, I don't give people what they want in a story, I give them what they need, right? And I think that the ability for us to process this ending is natural and necessary, and that's the way that it should be. And the releasing of the cuckoo to be what the cuckoo is supposed to be, supposed to be free, supposed to be, you know, out there doing whatever it's going to do. Um, all of that, along with Wanda's death, which is another moment of no, you know, you just want to resist that, you know? Um, and yet here we have dream from his perch of being able to see things from such a wider perspective and the nature of things and how things are supposed to be, um, that it gives us an opportunity to kind of sit with that, sit with that resistance, you know, sit with that. Um, that need to accept that this is the way the story not only does end, but maybe the way that it should end. It gives us a chance to accept endings, which is something that we culturally are not really good at. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I found it so interesting that I had this deep, deep, like response of resistance to the way this story ended. And yet at the same time, feeling that, oh, this is exactly what I needed. I need to be able to process endings. And I think that we are discouraged from doing that in our culture. Um, and this this story from 30 years ago saw that this is what people needed and gave it to them. And I thought that it was just, it was just wonderful. How did you, I don't know if you remember when you were first looking at this and first editing this, um, how did you feel about that ending? It seemed like, a literary ending to me. And I felt satisfied. At that point in my mm -hmm. life, I was really fresh out of um, Columbia's graduate school. And I'd been mm -hmm. reading a lot of um, trenchant literary short stories. And so mm -hmm. I, I recognized the rhythms of this. Although, okay, so this is my, my father, Robert Sheckley, who, mm -hmm. you know, and, and Neil was thinking of him a bit when he titled this, he used to lampoon mm -hmm. literary endings by saying, ah, a literary ending. The boy scuffed his foot against the pavement. Tomorrow, he thought, it would rain. <laughs> <laughs> Which was his, his take on the literary ending, and mm -hmm. I, I, I right. still remember it. But mm -hmm. what they give you, a literary ending gives you an acknowledgement that endings are not conclusive, that mm -hmm. endings are somewhat arbitrary and mm -hmm. that that in some way, you know, they, they aren't even endings. And here we have so many stories built in. And, you know, we've got, first of all, we've got Barbie going out west. And mm -hmm. this is a version of Barbie whose last idea is clearly an idea akin to Morpheus's. She is been so transformed. She's, you know, kind of mm -hmm. a prophetess at this point. Yeah. You can imagine her going like Natasha Leone in Poker Face and having all <laughs> these adventures on the road. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then we've got George's tongue, which has slithered off somewhere. Ugh, uh, yes. I forget you. I'm just like, I want to know what happens to George's <laughs> tongue. Surely uh, a, a tongue is not just going to go off and do nothing. I mean... <laughs> Does Barbie encounter George's tongue along the way? So, you know, we have we have all these wonderful nuggets of what could be the stories branching out from this. And even though Neil hasn't yet and may never explore them, it's what makes I think it's what made this ending so rich, you know, for me. I also I think that I 
I felt myself really thoroughly in that dual world that you get here. There is, there are two endings here. There's the ending in the scary. There's the ending in the dreaming. There is the ending where Barbie, frustrated and seething and yet making the right decision, suddenly has a moment of lift when she sees the the cuckoo transform into her true form and take off. And that's a wordless ending, but we know there's a lot mm-hmm. going on in there. Um, and then there's there's the waking world ending. So there's there's sort of, you know, it's a story within a story. You get those those two ends. I also love how Neil brings us back to the bird metaphor. I noticed mm-hmm. this time, what I don't think I noticed before was the remember those psychic birds that burst out of George's chest? Well uh-huh. then we and they are nasty birds, right? Oh, you're a nasty little thing, I think is what Thessaly <laughs> says. So we get these nasty relatives. And there's the quote, they leave in knots and clusters, and like a flock of huge black birds, they strut back to their pickup trucks and station wagons and hearses. These nasty strutting birds, and they remind me so forcibly of those psychic birds. So I, uh, I think I saw more clearly now how beautifully these two levels of story are, are linked at the end. Yeah, um, I, you know, one of the things too, is that like, we have all of this buildup where Barbie has been working so hard to prevent this ending of the land to save to rescue, right? That is the ultimate capital G good goal, right? Um, But for a story to be complete, you don't need the protagonist to win at their goal. They just have to be in pursuit of their goal. And whether they win or lose is really immaterial. It's just that at the end, we have to have it resolved one way or the other. Whatever this fight is, win or lose, both of them are fine, but we need to have one. And here we have Barbie who has lost on her goal, the goal that was so clear and has been the backbone of this story throughout the whole run. Um, And... That can be sometimes feel like a disappointing ending. Um, but I think that it's it's still, it's narratively legit. It's completely tight. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. And I like that it it makes us stop and ask these very questions. Yes. You know, okay, so Robert McKee in his book, story. I think it was him. You know, this is the problem with getting older and reading a lot of writing books. I think it's Robert <laughs> McKee. Let me know if I'm wrong. Eh, he had this, big, yeah. this line about um, sometimes a character will have a conscious desire and they will have an unconscious desire that contradicts the conscious desire. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if that is the case, then it is the unconscious desire that really forms the arc of the character's development. And I would say that Barbie's Barbie's unconscious desire has been to connect with her most authentic self, that self Mm -hmm. that felt most alive in the dreaming. And what she needed was not to return to the dream or, you know, at the end she gets the chance to resurrect the fantasy, yeah. the quest. Of course, it, it, won't, it, back. it won't be a real quest anymore because it was it was an escapist world that became real when the cuckoo mm-hmm. moved in and posed yeah. a real threat. If she goes back to it, it will not be authentic anymore. So what she chooses is her, you know, subconscious true desire, which is to continue mm-hmm. becoming her most authentic self, which links her character arc with that of the cuckoo. So the cuckoo's mm-hmm. not a little girl Barbie, although she she wears that disguise. And yet, you know, it is that classic thing where the, the main protagonist and the main antagonist are mirror shadow images of each other. Yeah, a doppelganger set. Absolutely. And I absolutely love that. Um, yeah, the conscious and unconscious desires that are in conflict is a classic internal conflict. And so while Barbie's external conflict in this story was rescue the land and she failed, um, there is and and also like you bring up a really good point that she had the opportunity She could have, she could have brought it back, but instead chose to go back to the, you know, the waking world safely with her friends also safe. 
you know, um, and making that choice is is a moment of actualization of walking away from the fantasy world where she is a princess. Um, and the fantasy that created a space for that cuckoo to kind of come and and live and and struggle against, struggle to be free from, you know? Um, so in the end, she chose her freedom, you know, because who she is in the dream world is an escape. It is a fantasy. And the real world is where her life needs to be. Yes. And I think that there's something wonderful, first of all, that Morpheus holds her a little bit responsible for whatever yeah. evil there is in the cuckoo by saying you were holding her back by holding herself mm -hmm. back barbie was yeah. all you know from from letting go of fantasy she was also holding the cuckoo back may i just say that um i've already done the spoiler so i'm <laughs> i'm glad i did so i can point out that a more conventional path would have been for Barbie and Morpheus to have sparks and then to find out that Barbie and Morpheus had been involved. But no, mm -hmm. no, it's not the gorgeous, <laughs> busty blonde. It's the bespectacled, you know, kvetchy, ornery witch yeah, woman the, of the lowlands. The witch woman, right. Um and I think you need somebody uh, who has a lot of power and a lot of supernatural, you know, juice going on to uh, to stand up to Morpheus. But um, yeah, I love this. And again, and here we go again. We've got this question of evil and the nature of evil. Um, she's dangerous. She's evil. And he goes, dangerous, perhaps, but evil. She acts according to her nature. Is that evil? And you asked me that same question earlier in this run when I was talking about the cuckoo is evil and da 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 da. And you were like, well, hey a minute. And I'm like, oh God. So now I've got to think about this. Thank you for making me think deep thoughts. <laughs> um, but it is like when you think if something is acting in accordance with their nature, like, you know, it, it makes you ask, what is the nature of evil? What is, what is quote unquote goodness, you know? Um, and is Barbie the good and the cuckoo is the evil or are they just both trapped? Okay, I, w I want to do the Horseshack thing from Welcome Back, Carter. Yes, ooh, yes, yes. Oh, oh, I'm raising my hand, Mr. Oh, Carter. Oh, Mr. Mr. Yeah, yes, exactly. So I have read that, um, that animals that are capable of creativity are the ones who are really capable of cruelty. And so mm -hmm. any time you've got an animal that is creative enough to take something and do something with it that is not directly involved with feeding itself, uh, with mm -hmm. teaching its young how to hunt. You know, cats are, are play with their prey. In, it is a way of teaching the young animals how to yes. kill an animal. They sort of half kill it and then bring it home to their kittens. Mm -hmm. and, and it's all built into their, their instinct. But then you have other animals like chimpanzees, uh, and dolphins and whales who are capable of using things playfully to entertain themselves. And these mm -hmm. are the animals that are also capable of cruelty. And I, I think it's an interesting – I think that only animals or creatures <laughs> that are capable of escaping their programming – are capable mm -hmm. of what I would call evil and also capable of amazing goodness. If if mm -hmm. if your if your instincts are holding you tightly within your program, I don't think anything you do can be considered evil. But when you really get some free will in there and all the all the animals with um really complex this is what I've I've heard described that it's the animals with complex social groups that can mm -hmm. form and reform. I guess, you know, I'm not speaking about ants because as far as I know, they they can't escape their programming, but but right. mammals. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess I guess octopi are not social animals, but okay. I don't know if mm -hmm. I don't know if octopi are capable of cruelty. <laughs> um but anyway, by that token, I don't think that we see the cuckoo is following her programming. She is mm -hmm. doing, she, she is, she is a metaphor, but she's also, you know, she's, so she's not evil. I will venture that she is not evil. It's, it's very, it's an interesting question and clearly one that we cannot 
we've been trying as as you know a, a culture to answer for for a very very long time or as people to answer like what is the nature of good what is the nature of evil and also the idea that we will attribute um an, an entity a person as being good like personifying goodness, personifying evil. When the fact is, is that everybody is capable of doing things and, and engaging in acts that are both good and are evil. But in and of yourself, your nature, like, you know, is it someone's nature to be evil? You know, um, I think that those are interesting questions. And I think that we kind of step away from that mode of thinking in this story. And that, you know, people or entities or, you know, whatever consciousness, right, has the capability and the choice of doing things that are good, doing things that are evil. And also, you know, we get a little ends justify the means, right? Like, who knows what the cuckoo's going to do now? She got what she wanted. Oh, right. Oh, we she know got what she needed to be free. <laughs> we know what she's going to do. She's going to mm -hmm. go and find herself a cuckoo mate. And lay her eggs in somebody else's world. In somebody else's world. It's interesting. I think that these are really interesting questions. And this, of course, is like one of the beautiful things about art and about fiction, um, is that it really does give us a chance to sort of reflect on what these things are. What is the nature of good and evil? I mean, is there a crunchier question to find yourself asking yourself after having engaged in some storytelling, which is what I absolutely love. Um, we also have the the safe, you know, exit of um, of Hazel and Foxglove, little maiden, little mother. Um, and I understand there are some uh, some mild spoilers here for that as well. Spoiler alert! Yeah, I I ended up just sprinkling them the, the breadcrumbs that are left. I'm spoilered throughout because there's so much <laughs> to talk about in Lucien's library. There's so much, yes. Um, so the future does indeed have strange journeys ahead for this pair, and they mm -hmm. uh, reappear in a death special. Mm -hmm. That sounds like fun. I'm very <laughs> excited about that. Um, all right. So let's talk a little bit more about Wanda. Uh, we've spent a lot of time in in the dreaming and the end of the land and all of that. But we've we've lost Wanda through this process. And Wanda was lost. Everybody who went down the moon road and went to, to see Morpheus and to save the land uh, survived. But Wanda was murdered by Thessaly's turfiness, right? Um, I mean, essentially, Wanda wouldn't have been there to die in that circumstance if, if Thessaly had allowed her to go with the rest of, you know, of the women along this road, right? Um, and so we, we lose Wanda. Wanda dies protecting Barbie, which is an honorable way to die, to protect somebody else, right? Um, but we go to Kansas and everyone is calling her Alvin. They're cutting her hair. They're burying her in a suit. And it is heartbreaking. Her family is terrible. But then Barbie sits at her grave and talks to her and writes her real name in lipstick on the tombstone. God, it's making me, I'm almost going to cry just talking about it. That, that acknowledgement of who she is that cannot be denied um, is so beautiful. And then this wonderful moment where she remembers the dream of seeing Wanda with death and Wanda is Wanda and everything is okay. Oh my God. I got to tell you that one of the weirdest things about this whole experience for me is um, I met Rachel Pollock's nephew a couple of times oh, uh, once yeah. at the, at her bedside when she was dying and once at the funeral and her nephew said, you know, he, he said something like the first, you know, when I first knew her, you know, and he told me her other name, the name she, mm -hmm. she had used before. And, um, and I, I'd never heard it said, I, I'd never known that. And, and he fully embraced and accepted Rachel as his aunt, as his I say aunt. I always say aunt so people will think I'm not the New Yorker that I am. <laughs> I grew up saying aunt. Um, and uh, But he knew her in a different guise. Mm -hmm. And yeah. while Rachel, I, I was never in any doubt about um, the fact that she was a woman. 
She mm-hmm. also talked to me uh, about Tiresias, and Tiresias was a, a blind person prophet in ancient Greece who experienced life both as a man and as a woman. Mm-hmm. And she talked about how in a lot of cultures with shamanism, there is this fluidity of, of passing between the genders. Mm-hmm. And so it, I don't know, these, I, this is not a coherent statement, which is not usually what I try and do on a podcast. <laughs> but I'm thinking about, of course, what Wanda's family does is wrong, but in in a way, she is magical because of the fact that mm-hmm. she has she has chosen herself very deliberately, and she has also experienced this world in two in two guises in some respects, mm-hmm. and that, according to Rachel, you know, was a, a powerful magical place to be. Um, uh, yeah. So I, uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry, that's a big digression. I don't know. I mean, in terms of the meaning of Wanda losing her life, and she's our trans character, that feels very wrong. But, you know, the writerly reasons that mm-hmm. Neil chose to make it her is yeah. because it stabs us so very much. I don't think... Okay, I'm going to sound like the cruelest savage in the world. But mm-hmm. if you're a writer, sometimes you think, well, we got to have a sacrifice. Who should it be? Shouldn't be Barbie. She's the main <laughs> character. Should it be Hazel? Should it be Foxglove? Who gets killed? And, mm-hmm. you know, I think that Wanda, like Wilkinson, is is sort of the, one of the most beloved characters in this storyline. And so sacrificing her gets you a lot of emotional payoff. I think that it absolutely does. And I think that there is a a resistance because we have, like, there's the, the trope, kill your gaze, right? That if, um, if someone in a story is, is queer in any way that by the end of the story, they will have died. Right. Um, and so one of the, the, the pushing back against that is that, you know, a, a queer character can never die ever, ever, or, you know, we're, we're contributing to this idea. Um, and I think that you, you can't simplify anything down to, uh, you know, like a, a strict edict like that. I think that you need to be conscientious about what you're doing as a writer. Um, and Wanda is a loss that we are meant to feel. Um, and Wanda is a loss, not because she is a trans character, but because she is Wanda and because she's so incredibly precious to us in this telling of this story. And, and we need to understand what that loss means, especially because Wanda would have been fine if she had been accepted for who she is. Yes. And, and by sacrificing this character, we get to, we get in a way the rebuttal. So for anyone who says, well, if, you know, Thessaly and the moon both agree that, you know, Wanda Mm -hmm. shouldn't have gone along, you know, is that the author's message? I think the rebuttal is, Dora and Wanda's parents are absolutely not presented as sympathetic characters. Mm -hmm. And I I, I think it would be very hard to argue that Neil would have chosen Dora uh, and her, Mm -hmm. you know, you're born a girl, you wear pink, you're born a boy and you wear blue, that's it. Uh, That is meant to reflect his true position on the matter. Mm -hmm. And so I think there is something about this ending that I, I do think just just really staying with the text puts puts paid to that idea that mm-hmm. that Thessaly is meant to be an authority figure on this, or even that the moon is meant to be an authority figure right. on this. Just because it's the moon doesn't mean it's going to be right, right? You know. Well, and as Rachel would have pointed out, the moon in tarot <laughs> represents mm-hmm. illusions and delusions. Absolutely. It sometimes does. Absolutely. it, you know, sometimes that card represents going with your gut and your gut is lying to you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And one of the amazing things about tarot is that it, it has a card for all of these experiences in all of these ways. And the moon, yeah, like one of the things about the moon is the moon always means that you are um, convinced of something that you think is true. And it is not as true as you may think it is. 
Um, so to have that happen in the shadow of the moon, I think, is also something to be considered. Um, but we are going to take a quick break. We are going to come back for a Lucien's library that is jam-packed with all sorts of stuff for us to, uh, to talk about. So uh, we're going to break and we will be right back. All right, we're back for Lucian's Library. And first up, we have a rare corrections note. Uh, we talked about Alianora in the last uh, episode. Um, and I had asked Elisa, is there any more of Alianora's story? Do we get a sense of who she is or what's going on with this character? And Elisa, I think, said no, or she didn't remember. And we did hear from y'all. We got uh, tweets on Twitter, um, got an email, uh, everybody saying that Alianora Alianora's story is part of Sandman Overture, which was published for the 25th anniversary of Sandman in 2013. Um, so we deeply apologize for the oversight. Uh, unlike Lucienne, we do not have all of the material at the tips of our fingers all the time. So No, you know, you go when you're young from forgetting stuff that you were supposed to have learned in a class to getting older and forgetting <laughs> stuff that actually happened, you know, uh, on, your, on your watch. So. Right. Um, all right. So here's here we are in Lucien's library. Let's talk about it. Let's start with you recently interviewed Neil at Woodstock Book Fest. All right. So our apologies for uh, for skipping the Eleanor thing. Um, Elisa, I understand that there is a uh, a letter from Neil on finishing up a game of you. So this is what is at the the tail end of the uh, game of you collected trade paperback. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A brief afterward. This story was written in a number of places, mostly in an office in Sussex, England, a hotel room in Wilmington, North Carolina, and an apartment in Northampton, Massachusetts. I couldn't and wouldn't have done it without Jonathan Carroll, who talked me into telling a story I thought best left alone, and who taught me that one of the purposes of a writer is to write it new. The late Don Melia and his unnamed just as late roommate who planted a seed that became Wanda. Kevin Eastman gave me somewhere to hide while I was writing part of the story. Dolores Meeks and Susan Alston made sure I was fine, and Scott and Ivy McLeod took me out for ice cream. Steve Bissett, Michael Zuli, who was there the day the story began, Rick Veach, and the rest of the Massachusetts Mafia gave me support and encouragement. On the home front, I owe thanks to Mary Gaiman, our son Michael, and to Holly, our daughter, from whom I learned the cuckoos that cuckoos go lolly lolly. <laughs> My thanks to Sean McManus, to Colleen Doran, and to Brian Talbot, who rescued us at the last moment, and to Stan Walk, George Pratt, and Dick Giordano. Todd Klein did his usual remarkable job, and Danny Vazo made it happen in color. Karen Berger, my editor, kept editing despite having to go and give birth to Zachary Bruning in the middle. We were on the <laughs> phone at the time, honestly. And Elisa Quitney, assistant editor, dropped in at the deep end, did miracles. Dave McKean is one of a kind, and it's hard to thank him enough for his vision or his friendship. Bob Kahn brought to this collected edition the same dedication and obsession with detail he brought to Season of Mists. It's appreciated. And there are other people without whom. Babs, Roz, Rachel, Ian and Anne, Patrick and Teresa, Steve Bruce, Will and Emma, Steve Jones, Pete Atkins, Jim Chadwick, Tom Pyre, Jim Herbert, and the list too long to print here and is anyway unfinished. I spent more than half a year with Barbie and Wanda and Hazel and Foxglove and Wilkinson and Thessaly and the rest of them wandering around in my head. Some nights, I still miss them. Neil Gaiman, <laughs> 4 of March, 1993. Oh, wow. That's incredible. What a wonderful letter. Um, yeah, in the end of the um, of the book, there's all the, the credits and the little bios for everybody there. Elisa, what's in your bio? My bio. I wrote this. Elisa Quitney, uh, not pictured, assistant editor, had a security blanket called Schmata and two imaginary friends named Roland and Syrup. Roland got his name from a small boy in Mallorca who cracked open his head running full tilt into a wall. <laughs> I love it. It's such a wonderful if any of you uh don't already have the um 
the the volumes, the whole volumes uh, themselves. There's really some wonderful stuff in there. It's incredible. Danny Vaz's favorite book, he was the colorist, was Green Eggs and Ham. He had an imaginary <laughs> friend, but he didn't last long. He kept cutting out on me. His name was Skids. <laughs> ah! <laughs> I guess there's a lot of imaginary friends here. I think that I think we've got a theme: the imaginary friends that end up, you know, uh, causing all manner of mayhem if we do not allow them to uh, to leave and and find their own way in the world. I guess. And I'll read Neil's. Neil Gaiman's favorite toys were mostly books. His favorite game was to find somewhere inaccessible and out of the way and go read there for hours. He knew that he could go to Narnia or Oz or Sumeria or New York if he just said the right thing or rubbed the right magic charm, but it just never happened. (laughs) I love it. So Karen Berger uh, goes into labor in the middle of this um, of this run and you just had to take over. So you, you know, were basically functioning as editor on, on how many of these issues? I don't remember. I don't remember. I would probably have to look it up. Isn't that crazy? I don't. I mean, it was before I was supposed to. So she was getting ready to have me take over with a whole list of Mm -hmm. things. And I would go out. Usually I would bring her back lunch. We we liked the same lunches. Mm -hmm. Back when gluten was considered healthy, we would have like a piece of barbecue (laughs) gluten and some broccoli. And, (laughs) uh, and, And then I came back and she was gone. Mm-hmm. So I was okay. So here's my my taking over story. I don't think I've told this one here, mm-hmm. I, but I, as we've already established, I don't remember anything. They'll let us know if you have. Yes, don't there worry. was some <laughs> Sandman promotional thing, and um and and Sandman had a big uh, cape in it that was colored in the poster purple. Mm-hmm. And I said, I don't think it should be purple. It's too bright a purple. Neil's going to be upset. I need to. And I, I'm, I'm trying whatever I can to get this changed. And uh, and Paul Levitz, who was then vice president, called me into his office and he said, mm-hmm. I, too, was once an ambitious young assistant editor. And I, I was thinking, God, I'm not ambitious. I'm just terrified. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. Well, it must have been a lot because she did go into labor early. So you were not as prepared as like you had hoped that you would be when you got thrown into this, um, this role, you know, on this story. Um, But in the end, I think it came out fantastic. So congratulations to you. Thank you. Well done, young Lisa. (laughs) (laughs) Lolly, lolly. Yeah. Lolly, lolly. Um, all right. So let's go ahead and talk about the interview that you did with Neil in Woodstock, which I was able to uh, travel out and and be there. Um, it was incredible. You were brilliant. And Neil, of course, was also as he always is when he does a performance. Anybody who ever gets a chance to go see him, I highly recommend it. I've seen him speak twice and, and it was absolutely lovely. Um, so how was that experience for you? It was kind of a wild night. It was a wild night. I had prepared uh, a bunch of questions, as one is supposed to do. Yes. And I mm-hmm. put them in this little uh, box. Wait, I've got my box over here. So cute little polka dot box. But then yeah. I never really opened it. And instead, mm-hmm. I, you know, I was just, I knew that I needed the box there, like Dumbo's feather. Yes. But, yes. um, but I knew that, you know, we would just be talking together. And what mm-hmm. I had done to make sure I... I've done interviews before. I've led panels, but Mm -hmm. this felt a bit different. There was a theater, really cool theater in in Bearsville, New York. Oh my god, wonderful! Yeah. So it was this amazing theater, and I, you know, and over four hundred people, including Mm -hmm. a lot of my friends and family. So I really didn't want to screw up. So I I clutched and I got this little box at CVS. (laughs) It's like some little children's box for a, a project. Um, Mm -hmm. and what I remember is it was all going really well. And at one point I, I do that New York Jewish thing of, I tend to do an overlapping style. So this, Mm -hmm. okay. I find that particularly with British people, this is a difference. British people will often pause 
and they have not finished their story. It's just a, you know, where, whereas yeah. I had this with my, my, my ex too. Uh, whereas Jewish people tend to overlap. Like you'll talk and I'll, as we've noticed in the podcast, I am, I am definitely <laughs> Rhoda Morgenstern and not Mary Tyler Moore here. So Neil was telling some very compelling story about Coraline and how he basically stole the idea from his then, you know, four or five-year-old daughter, Holly, who had this whole story about people with buttons for eyes. And I said, oh, Holly, that reminds me. And Neil sort of says, oh, I, I yes, go ahead, but I, I just have a little more to this. I said, oh, no, no, you finish, and I'll come back to it. So, of course, the story goes in all these fascinating places. And just around the time there's a pause, and I'm thinking, I could bring it back to the Holly story, I realize, ah, oh, you know, we've been talking for a long time. I don't know how much time because I thought at the, but I have this vague sense that someone should have broken in by now and said, you know, time for the Q&A. So I said, how long have we been talking anyhow? <laughs> at, at which point uh, Martha Frankel said, and indeed, it is time for the Q&A. Mm -hmm. So I never mm -hmm. got to I think I've told that Holly story anyway, which is the story about Neil uh, working with me in uh yeah. At his, his house in, in the Midwest and, uh, mm -hmm. and and how Holly said, you just steal other people's ideas. <laughs> uh, which I hadn't realized how true it was because I hadn't realized mm -hmm. that that's where Coraline came through. That Coraline came from Holly. He told some wonderful uh, stories about writing children's fiction and, and writing horror for young kids. He was like four or five. You know, this was his target demographic. Well, it you know, it turned out that Neil just has, you know, horror hungry kids. So Holly mm -hmm. was looking for horror stories. So Neil went to a bookstore and said, you know, what have you got in horror for four or five year olds? Uh, because uh -huh. there, there, <laughs> there was not there was not a, a huge market for this. And when he wrote uh, Coraline, which he did in bits and pieces in in, in the background yeah. while other projects were going around, um, you know, the response was right away this is the best thing you've ever written and it's completely unpublishable <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, but the thing that really came you know it made me think like i i i love talking with neil this way i also loved the talk he had with george r r martin in which mm -hmm. george r r martin said you know being a writer is a career for a gambler and neil added mm -hmm. yes and you're gambling on yourself and mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking that's that's a thing I often struggle with. How do you keep going yeah. when someone says to you, that's unpublishable? I think I would have just put it back under my bed and said, I'm so silly. Uh, why did I think that this was a good idea? So, <laughs> you know, it's – it's um, he kept going with a lot of faith that, you know, if there was something that, that – you know, it, it wasn't just that he was writing ideas for children in the ether. He was very involved with his kids. He was, yeah. you know, spinning stories that were based on, you know, a real child's imagination. So it's mm -hmm. both, you know, because I think we've all had the experience where we get too lost in our own heads. And maybe that is an idea that should stay, you know, buried <laughs> in the drawer, knocking, <laughs> you know, against the, the rattling the, the drawer. But um no, it's an okay. So that was on Saturday, and the Thursday mm -hmm. right before, in order to calm my nerves, I'd gone over to his house, and he was taking care of Ash, his mm -hmm. son, who's uh, you know still a kid, you know, in, yeah. in the kid mode. And I got to watch again how Neil can both be parental. You know, he's mm -hmm. not. You know, there are always those parents that are inappropriately just a friend to the kid when really someone needs right. to tell them to, uh, you know, not chew mm -hmm. on the electrical wires. But right. but he was also able to join with him in his imaginative world. And I think mm -hmm. it's it, it it was so lovely to see that and um, and be reminded of 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 that side of Neil. I loved hearing those stories. And I, I think the faith that he had, 
you know, um, that Coraline kept coming back and it wasn't one publisher. It was lots of publishers. This is genius. It's wonderful. I loved it. I couldn't put it down. It's unpublishable. Um, until finally he did find a publisher who was going to, uh, to take the risk to actually do it. Um, but yeah, the idea of being a writer and, and gambling on yourself, I think is something that is, um, is a really wonderful thing to hear because we can sometimes be very doubtful in like, you know, is this going to, is this going to work? Especially if you're trying to make a living as any kind of artist, I think like, what if this is terrible? What if it's not any good? What if it's, you know, what if we can't make it work? Um, at the same time, you know, there was this idea, um, and I've heard this throughout the years through various writers, you know, conferences and whatnot is, is, write the book that you want to read, but you can't find. Mm. Um, and I think that that is great advice for going out and and being the first to do something in a particular space, which is usually how you end up becoming, you know, a big success and all that. Um, but it is scary. And to have that kind of gentle faith in yourself, um, I think that Neil felt like this was a story. I mean, the, what I got, and I can't speak for Neil, but what I got from what he said at the um, at the talk was that this was a story that he was interested in writing and wanted to write and wanted to finish. And when he finished it, he'd done what he wanted to do with it. And what happened after that was of mild interest, you know, but also not what he was doing the work for. And I think that that's something like when I teach my classes that I always talk about, like, you, the outcome is not your business. And when I start having those fears while I'm working about like, what is going to happen with this? Who's going to want to publish this? How am I going to make this work? Yada, yada, yada. It's not my business. My business is to write the thing, create the thing, and then move on to the next thing. And whatever happens with it is of mild interest you know, but it's not the reason why you go into a creative field. It's not the reason you do what you do. And I feel like Neil seems to me, now I don't know him very well, of course, at all, um, but seems to me like the kind of person who really has that that space down, who really understands that. And um, when he talked about all of this, it was with this like a mild amusement, whereas I would have been like, oh, I've spent a year working on this. This is panic for me that this year that I spent is going to be completely wasted. But he knew that time wasn't wasted either way. And that is the the kind of Zen writer space that I always aspire to. And it was wonderful to kind of see him in that space. And this, of course, is my reading into that story. None of that is stuff that he said, right? Outright, but that was my reading the subtext of that story through my own lens as a writer. Yeah, no, that I don't know. I mean, I I think underneath, I am sure that that is a state that he had to work to achieve because I think it's impossible. Sure. You know, I always keep saying to myself the mantra: "Nothing is wasted, nothing is lost" when it comes to yes. writing. But mm -hmm. uh, I I have to repeat it as a mantra because it it does not come naturally to me. I, I also want to mention here, I was just quickly looking up. So I my friend um, Beck, Beck mm -hmm. Rourke Mooney, who's actually got, she's in my writing group. She's got a, a book coming out, her first novel, We Are Mayhem, oh. a YA book. She took notes, which she sent to me from the uh, mm -hmm. from the talk. And I thought that that would be really useful. So here are Beck's notes from the uh, from the talk of, of things mm -hmm. she retained. Some we've already uh, talked about, the what if you got horror for four to five-year-olds, mm -hmm. uh, the editor's take. Um, other great little tidbits. And again, I was right there, so I, could, I couldn't remember these right. as clearly. Mm -hmm. The best of being a writer is being able to follow your obsessions. Love that. Um, I love writing novels, except for the loneliness and the backache. <laughs> And the difference between children's and adults' books. A children's book has to offer hope. Oh, my God. That was such a powerful moment when he said that. Because um, I look to adult books to provide hope, too. Like, I'm looking to everywhere but reality for some sense of hope, you know? Yes. Um, but in, in an adult book, you don't have to. You know, like we can go down these, these dark paths without an ending that says there's... Uh, 
you know, there's light at the end of that tunnel. Um, and so that being the distinction that Neil saw between writing for children and writing for adults, I thought was such an interesting perspective on, on those differences. But nothing else, like you could, you could make it dark, you know, but you just have to have the light at the end. Yes, absolutely. It, it you know, it has to exist in a universe that, that, mm -hmm. um, that makes a bit of sense at the end of the day, which, mm -hmm. you know, brings me back to that ending of A Game of You, which I think is, in the end, a hopeful, a hopeful ending. It may yeah. be nuanced. Uh, it may not be entirely, you know, all is set right with the universe, but it's hopeful. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So as I was, you know, we end a game of you with Wanda's funeral. And mm -hmm. here, you know, I began this week with Rachel's funeral. And, mm -hmm. um, and there I was, I was, I was sitting with with Neil. And I have always said that I wanted a traditional Jewish burial. Yeah. But I've never seen a completely traditional Jewish burial, because the most traditional you know it's not even a, a full coffin but just a, like a I guess you call it a pallet and the body mm -hmm. is wrapped in a shroud and it was so immediate and and people got up um and said incredibly moving things about Rachel and some of them were you know Neil got up uh, old friends tarot friends writer friends her wife Zoe mm -hmm. but the very last person to get up was this slender, um, I believe, young woman. I, I don't know her. So, you know, these days mm -hmm. I, I feel less certain. Um, she mm -hmm. was slender. She was young and had a buzz cut. And forgive me if I am wrong about mm -hmm. who you are. Um, but she said, I, I wasn't planning on getting up and saying anything. And she said, forgive me for I'm going to curse. And, you know, there we are. We're just in between Jewish prayers, to, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and she just says, I, I just feel the need to say, fuck yeah, Rachel. Fuck yeah. <laughs> I mean, just when I think about Rachel, I just want to say, fuck yeah. And I felt this shiver because it felt like such a Wanda moment. It was it mm -hmm. was lipstick setting a gravestone right and uh, yes. and after that came all the traditional Jewish prayers. People put uh, evergreen boughs and rose petals and shoveled the dirt into the grave. Mm -hmm. And I think I I I don't know. I feel a confusion of things right now. But I think mm -hmm. for me now, Rachel's funeral and Wanda's feel very linked. Maybe they will yeah. always be linked now. And. Um, you know, and, and, and taking your goodbyes where you can. Absolutely. Well, that is as beautiful a place to transition out of Lucian's library as any. Uh, so I will take that opportunity to move us into uh, Elisa, the favorite page for, um, we picked the same one. Uh, I, put you first. I put you first because I couldn't disagree. <laughs> I couldn't even offer anything else. I, I, we are all individuals. What can I say? <laughs> Absolutely. So you go it's first. It's the cuckoo. The yeah. cuckoo turning into a bird and flying away. I mean, the colors on that image are so incredibly beautiful. The the little girl um, who was causing all of this trouble just wanted to be free. And then once she was free and allowed to go, she transformed into her natural form and flew away. And there was something about that that was... I think just so beautiful and so beautifully expressed on the page. So beautiful. And yet, okay, so my, my father had always this expression, takes off like a big ass bird. And he would say, you know, <laughs> sometimes you write a brilliant book, but it you hope it's going to take off like a big ass bird. And it mm -hmm. doesn't. So I just thought, wow, there she is. A big ass bird. <laughs> a big ass bird. Absolutely. All right. So what's your favorite part of the story? Well, like you, I really, you know, my my true favorite, of course, is Wanda with death because mm -hmm. it's 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 where we we want death and need death, and I yeah think that death is um 
death trumps the moon when it comes to yeah. the true face of Wanda. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I thought that that was just incredible. Um, such a great moment. That said, that mm-hmm. said, <laughs> I, I, I don't know, Neil, I, I really want to know about the adventures of George's tongue. You know, I, okay, so this is, can I, can I digress for a moment? Yes, you may. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know, the comedian Bill Burr, Bill Barr, Bill. Yeah. Which, okay. Burr. Bill Burr. Mm-hmm. So he had, I saw this little clip where he's talking about how he's supposedly pro choice, but you have to admit, you know, that, and he calls uh, it murder and ex- makes this joke about how it's like you've got a birthday batter, a b- birthday batter for birthday cake. You put it in the oven and five minutes before you take it out. You, you know, I, I open the oven and throw it against a wall and, you know, mm. you can't just, anyway, I was so infuriated by this right. that I tried to craft a response because I was thinking, okay, first of all, not your batter, not your oven, dude, yeah. not your batter, yeah. not your oven. And also people don't like randomly try and throw the cake out five minutes before it's cake. That's not the way it works. It's more like, yes. Uh, either, you know, th- there are all kinds of reasons, and sometimes mm-hmm. that cake could be dangerous, mm-hmm. uh, has an ingredient that might destroy your oven, um, and kill you and, and kill, kill the, you, yeah, take which, the house down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which got me thinking about the gingerbread man. Uh-huh. And then I started to look up various versions of the gingerbread man. I'm sorry, is this too long a digression? This is very no, straight. No, fucking love it. Go, go, go. Yes. Okay. So then in Hungarian and Russian versions, there's a thing called the kolobek, which is mm-hmm. made uh, 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 of head cheese, which is not cheese at all, but the flesh of, right. an, of a calf yes. or a pig head that's been mm-hmm. simmered into kind of some kind of horrific meatball. Like ball. a gel? Like a, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this horrific meat ball of face <laughs> meat uh, in yes. the story eats the people who made it and then goes around eating people until it explodes uh, from eating too many people. And I'm thinking, oh, why has no one turned this into a children's horror? And <laughs> I I am seeing a connection between mm-hmm. the Kolobek and George's tongue. I just think that it it's, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it redeems itself. Maybe it, it, it does some things and becomes more of a good character. Um, the the tongue? Yeah. Uh, you know, there there are some things George's tongue could do to help people along. I think that there are. <laughs> so I'm just, I, I'm sorry, yeah. this was a long digression. Um, uh, no. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm really kind of hoping that at some point Neil writes a poem or a children's book called George's Tongue. I would be first in line, first in line to grab it. (laughs) If you enjoyed this discussion and would like to join in, Patreon supporters can chat with us and each other through our Patreon Discord channel. To find out how you can support Chipperish Media, visit patreon.com slash chipperish. Other ways to show your support, write a great review on Apple Podcasts, tell your friends about the show, or ask Murphy to send everyone home safe and sound. This episode of Endless was edited by Chipperish content editor Jack Cram. Jack, you may ask a boon of me. Thanks so much for joining us. We are going on a short hiatus, but we'll be back August 8th with Thermidor, a standalone Sandman story about the French Revolution. Until then, perhaps in the future you should choose your traveling companions with more care. (laughs) 